Hello, my friends. It's Dr. Sharon with Clinic Reviews. I hope you're having a great day. Today, we're going to continue in the Blue Book, and we're going to talk about pulmonary edema. This is a very common problem, and you definitely can get tested on it, so I suggest that you watch this video. It's not particularly complicated, but you do need to make sure you know what it is. So let's go ahead and get started. Hello, Clinic Review family. It's Dr. Sharon with Clinic Reviews, the home of the very best NCLEX review in the entire universe, in my opinion. You know Mark Clinic is the goat of NCLEX preparation, and this channel is a part of the Greater Clinic Review organization. We do primarily focus on NCLEX prep, but you can also learn how to take standardized tests by watching this channel as well. We do offer some uh, paid services. You can go to clinicreviews.com to sign up for our 21-plus hour online on-demand review with Mark Klimek, who's the goat of NCLEX prep. We also have a streaming service where you can get all the videos that you find here plus more. And we also have Zoom tutoring uh, that you can sign up for a small group tutoring. You can meet me live over Zoom if you want to get to know me that way. Starter, we're talking about pulmonary edema. This is in the blue book. You know, you can get the blue book on Amazon. And uh, Mark Klimek wrote it. I don't make any money off of it. So I feel like I can sort of hawk it a little bit if I want to. And um, it's content. It's content you have to know. And then I write questions to go along with it. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. These are not particularly difficult questions. They're very fundamental, but you absolutely have to know the answers to these questions. So there's no superfluous questions here, okay? These are all fundamental content that you have to know. Which diagnostic test result is most indicative of pulmonary edema? Elevated troponin levels, increased BNP levels, decreased white blood cells, or elevated liver enzymes. So you have to understand that pulmonary edema is fluid in the actual lungs, in the alveoli, and um, it most often gets there because of heart failure. So if that's the case, there's no lab test to tell us the person has pulmonary edema, right? There's no specific lab test. But since the most common cause of pulmonary edema is heart failure, then you would look for an increased BNP level. A client arrives in the emergency department with acute pulmonary edema, which symptom would the nurse prioritize for immediate intervention? Peripheral edema, jugular vein distension, pink frothy sputum, or tachycardia. Now these are all symptoms of pulmonary edema. They're all symptoms of pulmonary edema. So which one would be most concerning to you? And they're all objective findings, right? They're all objective findings. So I can't prioritize over one over another based on objective subjective because we always prioritize objective findings over subjective findings, but they're all objective findings. So how do I differentiate between several objective findings? When you have one patient with several objective findings, the first thing I do is I use ABCs. If ABCs doesn't work, then I go acute over chronic and all of these are acute, also acute. So I couldn't do that, but I can do ABCs. Peripheral edema is... I really wouldn't say any of them. You could, I guess you could say it's circulation, but it's really not because it's third spacing. Jugular vein distension is circulation. Pink frothy sputum is airway breathing. Tachycardia is circulation. So I have to go with the pink frothy sputum. Now you may say, Sharon, I would have gotten that right anyway. Well, that's great. But when you're sitting in the NCLEX in a high stress situation, sometimes we second guess ourselves. So if you have a rule that will assure you that you are answering it correctly, that's a good rule to use. A client at risk for pulmonary edema requires ongoing assessment for which signs? Client at risk for pulmonary edema requires ongoing assessment for which signs? So in other words, if they're at risk for pulmonary edema, then they must have some kind of heart failure. So really what this is saying is what are some other heart failure symptoms? I mean, you can use clinical reasoning to get to that point. Jugular vein distension, weight gain, cough with frothy sputum, warm extremities, increased urine output. Well, if we're concerned about other heart failure symptoms, JVD is a heart failure symptom, weight gain is a heart failure symptom, and cough with frothy sputum is a heart failure symptom. Cough with frothy sputum specific is specific to pulmonary edema, but the others are all associated with heart failure, and so that's why we're watching for those things. You would actually expect cooler extremities and decreased urine output. 
Which medication is anticipated for the initial management of acute pulmonary edema? Metoprolol, furosemide, spironolactone, or digoxin? Well, pulmonary edema is fluid in the lungs. It's fluid in the lungs. So we have to get the fluid off of the lungs. We can treat the underlying problem at some point, but we have to get the fluid off. So how do we get the fluid off? Well, it's going to be a diuretic. So B, furosemide is a potassium wasting diuretic. Spironolactone is a potassium sparing diuretic. The tones, aldactone, spironolactone are potassium sparing. The ides, furosemide, hydrochlorothiazide are potassium wasting. And we most often use the potassium wasting loop diuretics. Those are what we use for fluid volume overload. The nurse instructs a client recovering from pulmonary edema on fluid restriction. What is the primary purpose of this intervention? The nurse instructs a client recovering from pulmonary edema on fluid restriction. Okay, so I guess we're instructing them about why they're on this fluid restriction. Prevent electrolyte imbalance, decrease respiratory secretions, enhance medication effectiveness, reduce workload on the heart. Well, I told you pulmonary edema is primarily from heart failure. And so the reason we do a fluid restriction for pulmonary edema is so because when the the heart is pumping, if it can't get the fluid out, it's either going to back up into the lungs or it's going to back up into the periphery, like jugular venous distension. So we're trying to reduce the workload of the heart by re, uh, restricting fluid. Now, just so you know, there is an objective measurement for fluid restriction. So normal fluid intake is two to three liters a day. If we restrict fluid, if, that, if you have an order for fluid restriction, that means less than 2,000 mils a day. If, they, if you see an order to push fluids... That means more than 3,000 mils a day. That's what those words mean clinically. So you should know that so you can interpret scenarios correctly. Which of the following are common manifestations of pulmonary edema? Common manifestations, dyspnea, bradycardia, orthopnea, cyanosis, polyuria. So pulmonary edema impairs gas exchange. That's what fluid in the lungs does. So you're going to look for signs and symptoms of impaired gas exchange. So dyspnea is feeling short of breath. It's a subjective finding. I feel short of breath. So yes, that would definitely be um, impaired gas exchange. Bradycardia. No, you would see tachycardia. If you have impaired gas exchange, the heart beats up, uh, speeds up because it's trying to get more oxygen to the tissues. So bradycardia is not your best option. Orthopnea is difficulty um, breathing when you're lying flat. Which is, a, which is a symptom of impaired gas exchange. Cyanosis is an objective symptom of impaired gas exchange. So you start to become either pale or blue, kind of blue around the lips. That's a very objective finding of impaired gas exchange. And polyuria is increased urine output. That's certainly not a symptom of impaired gas exchange. Now, if you look at this, I want you to notice I said pulmonary edema affects gas exchange. So the problem, really what you're looking for is a manifestation of impaired gas exchange. I want you to notice that I didn't specifically say what are manifestations of pulmonary edema. Because pulmonary edema is just the description of the problem, but it's not telling you what the pathological outcome is. The pathological outcome of pulmonary edema is impaired gas exchange. I mean, if they have pulmonary edema but no impaired gas exchange, then they're not going to have any symptoms except maybe some crackles in their lungs, right? They may have some crackles if they have pulmonary edema with no impaired gas exchange. So you're not going to see any of these things unless you have impaired gas exchange. So in order to be able to answer this effectively, I had to say, what is the actual problem? And remember, what I didn't do, listen, what I didn't do is... I took care of a patient last week who had pulmonary edema. What did they look like? I did not say that because this is a conceptual question. This is not a question about a specific patient that you had last week. It's a conceptual question. And so you have to think textbook, right? Conceptual is tech. When I say that, I mean like textbook. You have to think textbook. What are they going to tell you are the problems associated with pulmonary edema? Which position is best for a client experiencing acute pulmonary edema? So acute pulmonary edema, again, is impaired gas exchange. So if we have impaired gas exchange, fluid in the lungs, right? We said they have dyspnea, they have orthopnea, they have cyanosis. So what is, what is the best positioning for that supine, which is lying flat on your back? Semi-fowlers, which is the head of the bed up 30 degrees. High-fowlers, which is the head of, head of the bed up 45 to 90 degrees. Or Trendelenburg, which is flat with the head down. Well, we definitely don't want the head down. 
So D is out. Supine is laying flat. We already know orthopnea is a problem. So that's out. So do we want the head of the bed up 30 degrees or higher? And I say, look, if they have acute pulmonary edema, I'm going to put it up higher than 30 degrees. Um, maybe even some pillows behind their back to even set them up higher. Uh, so they can, that can help them with breathing. So high fowlers is the correct position. Which cardiac disorder is most, the most common cause of pulmonary edema? Cardiac disorder. All right. So I already told you it was heart failure. So we have A and B is both heart failure. C is aortic stenosis. Aortic stenosis. If the aorta is stenosed, I mean, it could cause pulmonary edema. So aortic stenosis can cause pulmonary edema. It's just not common. Mitral valve prolapse. Mitral valve prolapse allows fluid to regurgitate back through the mitral valve. So I guess it could cause pulmonary edema, but very uncommon for that to be the cause. I mean, it can, right? But that's uncommon. And that's why it says the most common cause. So C and D are out. So we know it's heart failure. So the right side, when the right side of heart fails, it backs up into the jugular vein. So right-sided heart failure would be common cause of jugular venous distension. Left-sided when it fails, it backs up into the lungs, which causes pulmonary edema. So left-sided heart failure is the most common cause of pulmonary edema. Which medications are typically included in pulmonary edema? Treatment, ACE inhibitors, diuretics, inotropic agents, antibiotics, or beta blockers. So pulmonary edema, remember, does not happen in isolation. It just doesn't. Nobody's walking around perfectly healthy and all of a sudden they get pulmonary edema. There's got to be a cause for it. It's a symptom. Pulmonary edema is always a symptom of something else. And so it's most often a symptom of left-sided heart failure. So the question is, how are we going to treat the symptom and the cause, right? The cause, because we got to treat both. So ACE inhibitors decrease afterload, but they decrease blood pressure which decreases afterload, the force against which the heart has to pump. So if the, if the heart doesn't have to exert so much force to get the blood out, well, that's going to help with that heart failure symptom, right? So ACE inhibitors seems like a good idea. Diuretics, very straightforward. They get rid of the fluid. That's good. I like that. Inotropic agents. The word inotropy means force of contraction. So a positive inotrope increases the force of contraction. A negative inotrope decreases force of contraction. So an inotropic agent increases force of contraction. Well, we already have a failing heart. So if we can increase the strength or the force of contraction, that's going to be helpful. Antibiotics, there's no, there's not an infection. We don't do antibiotics. Beta blockers. So beta blockers actually reduce the work of the heart uh, because it decreases sympathetic nervous system stimulation of the heart. So beta blockers now there are some beta blockers we don't use, but there are, but beta blockers are a classic treatment for heart failure. We just use specific ones. So we do use beta blockers. So we need to do A, B, C, and E. Okay. So that's it. That was short and sweet. I hope you're having a great day. Um, I did some videotaping of my dogs. I did it earlier, but I cut it out of the earlier and I put it now. Some people have said, told me that, um, seeing my dogs helps decrease their anxiety. And I'll tell you what, that's why I have dogs. Y'all, they decrease my anxiety. I know some people it increases your anxiety because you find dogs to be very stressful. I don't find them to be stressful. I find them to be incredibly, um, joy bringing. They bring me so much joy in my life. I love, love, love having my dogs. Would I have fewer dogs? Well, I wouldn't have seven. I will admit I don't love having my daughter's dogs here because they do mess up my pack vibe a little bit. I mean, they're good dogs, don't get me wrong, but they do mess up my pack vibe a little bit. So, but it's totally fine. I'm glad to have them. I'm glad we can do it. She watches my dogs for me a lot too. So, all right. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care. Bye. I am babysitting my daughter's dogs today. So we have seven dogs in the house. This is Koa, our Alaskan Malamute, and this dog talks constantly, and he loves to be outside, but it's too hot right now for him. I feel bad that this poor dog doesn't get to live in Alaska, but she's, I'm sorry, he, she's a she. All of our dogs are male, so I always call, my daughter has only female dogs, so I keep calling them he's, but they're not he's. Do you want to come up here and meet everybody? Come here. Come here, Koa. Come here. Come here. Koa, come on. Come on, Koi. Come on. Come on, Koi. There we go. There she is. There she is. That's a good girl. 
Hi, yes. And then my other dogs don't want to be left out. So here's Cooper. Oh, there's a Cooper. There's a Cooper. Yes. And, and uh, Barkley. Barkley, where are you, buddy? There's my Barkley. All right, come here, Malibu. This is my daughter's other dog, Malibu. Come here. Come on. Now, this is interesting because Malibu is Barkley's mother. Barkley and Israel. This is Barkley and Israel's mama, right? You said, don't go, girl. Don't go, girl. And Israel and Kodak are not in here with me. And Charlie is down there. Do you want to say hi, Charlie? Do you want to say hi to everybody? Come here. Come here. Barkley, look back. Come here, buddy. <laughs> Come here. Come here, Charlie. Come here, buddy. Here we go. Here's my little Charlie. Here's my little Charlie. Oh, there's a good boy. There's a Charlie. He just turned one on July 2nd. July 2nd, didn't you? You such a good boy. Such a good boy. He's my baby. Yes. Oh, you're such a good boy. 